what is enlightenment? Each one of us are heading towards technology. We have iPhones. Phones became important, the outer engineering. I became subservient, the inner mechanism. Everybody is interested in outer engineering. It has brought men to new levels of technology, new levels of comforts. But is man peaceful? Answer to that question, I leave it open for everyone to decide. But one thing is certain, the modern man has become neurotic. His focus is on outer engineering and inner engineering is missing. Enlightenment is the search for inner engineering. Remember, enlightenment is the search and discovery of inner engineering, the inner mechanism. It is erroneous to say that I am or someone is enlightened because enlightenment is the disappearance of ego. When ego is not there, there is no one to say anything. When ego is not there, there is no one to say anything. A Zen master said that I had been looking for something and when I reached, I found there was no one. Kabir says that Jab Maitha Tab Hari Nai, Jab Hari Tab Nai. As long as I was, God was not. And the moment God is, I am no more. Kabir's compositions are full of the experience the understanding of non-doing amidst the duality. It is the sense of ego that makes you know that I am a father, I am a husband, I am a rich man, I am this, I am that. When that sense of egoness disappears, who is there to say that I am enlightened? Instead it is to be said that enlightenment is. The moment one attains to enlightenment, he realizes that the entire world is enlightened. The entire cosmos to say is enlightened. If the flower could say or uh, is given a voice to say, Flower will say, in my blossoming I have realized that every seed has a potentiality to become a flower. This much can be said. In my blossoming I have come to this conclusion, come to this realization, come to this experience that every seed has the poten potentiality of blossoming. But it is not always true that every seed will become a flower. Some may be picked up by the birds in the beginning before they attain to their fruition. Some may rot, some may reach up to a certain stage in the process of flowering and when they are attained to their state of seedling, the animals eat them or there is a pest. Is pest that destroys the crop, as usually happens. In that process, master acts as a gardener. Every day he cannot pick up the flowers because when you look at it, rose chrysanthemum or marigold, there is a season of the flowers. And then outside the season, the flowers blossom sporadically. One here, one today, one tomorrow. When 
October comes or the autumn is there, beginning of the autumn, the gardener prepares the plants, the rose plants for upcoming season. He prunes the unwanted leaves, the unwanted branches that are unnecessarily taking the nourishment. He mulches the soil, puts the new fertilizers, new manures. The tree is in the process of recuperation. Then comes the spring. As the season begins to come, new foliage, new branches begin to shoot up on the tree. And then, but this is all is happening because on its own the plant cannot take care of. Unless it is left in the wild to remain wild, but the plant can remain wild growing on its own, unrestricted, without any laws. Because you remember all your moral laws, rituals, they have the authentication of the religions. Each religion authenticates certain morals, rituals, values and things like that and the followers continue to live within those laws. But a plant that grows in the wild has no morality, no laws, nothing there, it grows on its own. But as a part of the member of the society that you are in, you are still not a rebel, what it is going to happen in that? You have to compromise between this, these rituals, these normal ways and means of life and is still continue for inner mechanism. It becomes difficult. So on your own you cannot do. Master stands aloof. He follows the solitary path. He is a rebel. Only the rebels can reach the inner path. So he continues to take care of all the seeds. Some he picks up from the garden shop, some he picks up in the form of seedlings, prepares the soil, the flower bed, plants them, transplants from one place to another place because the seedlings are prepared at one place in a particular way, a different kind of mechanism, a different kind of methodology is required to take care of those, that process. Then he transplants to a different bed, starts taking care of it. And then one day, the season of spring, the season of awakening comes for those seeds. They begin to blossom. One flower blossoms, it's a beginning, it's an announcement that the season of spring, the season of awakening, the season of blossoming has come. Then one after the other, the flowers begin to blossom. But the flower cannot say that I have blossomed. Enlightenment is the disappearance of ego, it is the inner flowering. Disappearance of ego, desires and all that is tangible and concerned with the mind. Enlightenment is a state of no mind. It is a state when drop has merged into the ocean. But then a question arises if masters do not speak of enlightenment, how the seekers will get the first glimpse. And this first far away glimpse is relevant for the seekers. This is why we celebrate the day of enlightenment of the masters, the day of celebration, because life is celebration every moment. Whether it is happiness, sadness or sorrow, whatever it is, 
celebration is your way of life. But we do not celebrate. We celebrate in a different way. But the celebration means an expression of joy, dancing. Dancing is one of the methods of expressing your ecstasy, the inner joy that you have felt. So the days of Samadhi, the days of birth, we celebrate the birthdays. Because birth we take it for granted. Nothing is new. You have gotten something, but this appearance of that we do not accept. We want something that has come in our hand. We want it to remain in our possession alone. And that cannot happen. So death or demise is like disappearance of all that you have got attached to is disappearing. And you have not experienced something which is beyond the finite, beyond the death in your life. Lament. We do not celebrate the demise. Because that moment we try to remember our teddy bears. You remember when you were a little child, your mother says something to you. You go and pick up your teddy bear and a wide variety of teddy bears are available. And you pick up your teddy bear and you hug your teddy bear you feel comforted. So too the religions have developed their own way of teddy bears. But they do not call these teddy bears, they call gods in different names. A sad person immediately turns to the Virgin Mary or Jesus or Ram or Krishna. One falters or fails in love, suddenly he starts seeing the image of God, his teddy bear. And he holds on to that teddy bear. I wonder when the Disney World or the any company will begin to make the teddy bears of these, these religious teddy bears, instead of Minnie and Minnie or Mickey, when they will start making the religious teddy bears of all these religious denominations that we unconsciously hold into our consciousness as teddy bears. So we have not learned the art of celebrating. Celebration is the way of life. Celebration is life. If we learn to celebrate every moment, life will have a new dimension. As a result for your inner search to attain a new impetus, I am speaking to you on various aspects of enlightenment and also the experience of the masters who have attained to enlightenment. Again and again, it is a reminder, a celebration. Celebration is a way of reminder that life is celebration. So too, life is a process of inner mechanism, inner engineering. Therefore, remember, enlightenment is not ritual. And nothing is ritualistic in life. But we go on making everything ritual, because rituals means a set patterns. You are living by the dictates of the others. When you start living by your own light, you do not follow any rituals. The moment you make enlightenment ritual, you have moved far away from reality. There are certain things that you have to understand about enlightenment. Very often it is asked if enlightenment is accidental. It is something very significant to understand. Enlightenment is always accidental. You are not trying for it and all of a sudden something happens because ritual means you have an idea of something and you are dreaming, you are aspiring for it. But you remember when the experience comes, it is always comes to everyone as new. The experience of enlightenment of each master is new. 
We can learn from that. Do you think that they, each flower blossoms in the same way? Uh, the, when it blossoms, it has the same beauty and the fragrance? No. Each flower, when it blossoms, its fragrance, its beauty, its lush, its aura is totally different. This does not mean that you do not have to try for enlightenment. You have to try it. And it will happen on its own. There is another equally important thing that you have to remember. Certainly your trying is not going to bring it. You make your efforts. You are sitting down and trying to remember the phone number or name of a particular person. But you are not remembering. You make your efforts every possible efforts to remember that but it is not surfacing then what do you do you make your efforts efforts means your consciousness reaches to its limit it becomes tense that time then when you leave it Slowly and slowly it tends to get relaxed. All of a sudden the name or the number surfaces. When you are making the bread, the flour, we take the different ingredients, the flour, the yeast, the butter, milk, salt, sugar. All these have separate entities existence. You merge them together in order to make the bread. In that process when these are mixed together there is tension. The tension is gathered because you are constantly needing. The energy is being pumped into it. Whether you do it in the food processor or you do it manually but more and more energy is being pumped into it. All the various ingredients are trying to merge into one another, leaving their individual nature and trying to merge into something new. But you do not take that dough immediately and start making your, making your bread. You allow it to relax. So two things happen. Number one, your effort means you are reaching to the pinnacle of your efforts. This much effort you can put into. Then you, when the moment you leave it to relax, all of a sudden things happen. But making the effort, searching in all the direction, in every possible way, someday it happens certainly not because of your efforts but because of your intense urge a tremendous intensity like a flame within you it happens in order for the bread to rise to become the texture that is required it has to relax for a longer period of time the more the bread is allowed to relax, better the texture it comes. Those who know how to make the bread or the art of baking industry, they will know the importance of allowing the flour to relax. This is the fundamental rule of life. You make your efforts, then you leave everything. This is the Zen art of inner mechanism, inner engineering. You learn something, you are making an effort to learn. Your learning is an effort. Whatever you are producing is effort. Then you leave it. It sinks into you. It becomes part of your understanding. Right now it is infused into you. It is outside. You are making an effort. You are remembering the spellings of the words. You are trying to 
know the remember the rules of grammar pal the when shankar was traveling through the lanes of varanasi all of a sudden he heard a man trying to remember a hori headed with no teeth in his mouth trying to remember the rules of grammar because it is considered by hindus that the grammar is more important in the beginning it is in the beginning when you learn the art of driving you have to follow the rules and regulations and everything afterwards when the driving process sinks into you it becomes automatic the when to stop how to stop all that becomes a spontaneous and natural but you have to be aware of it your effort is not going to achieve it but making the effort searching in all directions in every possible way some day it happens certainly not because of your efforts but because of your intense longing a tremendous intensity like a flame within you but it is always accidental you cannot say that it happened because i did it or i made efforts for it otherwise things would have been very simple enlightenment is not ritual however after the master is no more and also with the passage of time the inner search becomes a mere ritual people sitting down in buddha's posture that is lotus posture called as buddha posture and trying to do the same thing which buddha did in order to attain before he attained to enlightenment he had a bowl of sweet rice he sat down on the full moon night under the the banyan tree the bodhi tree so buddhist monks do that as a ritual nothing happens look at the buddhist monks all are making it a ritual for example buddha was sitting in the bodhi tree when the enlightenment happened in every buddhist monastery there is a bodhi tree and they are sitting waiting for enlightenment enlightenment to happen as if both the tree has something to do with it yes the tree was innocent it has experienced a great a magnificent happening happening to someone who was ready buddha had eaten that evening a sweet made out of milk and rice buddhist monks think that has something to do with the light wind so for them it has become a spiritual food before sitting in meditation they eat that rice pudding kheer is the indian name for that sweet but enlightenment has nothing to do with this rice pudding buddha was sitting in the lotus posture for enlightenment because that is the posture was the most convenient to him and he chose that posture so he sat down in that so every buddhist monk sits in the same posture perhaps the posture has something to do with it the posture has nothing to do with buddha's enlightenment but millions throughout the history have been sitting in that posture torching their legs and now westerners have started learning yoga postures in which the lotus posture is the most important because buddha became enlightened in that posture for a westerner who has never been sitting on the floor and always sitting on the chair his whole life the lotus posture is difficult in a cold country you do not sit on the ground his legs are in tremendous torture but he tries hard it makes almost 3 months for him to attain to the lotus posture but only the lotus posture this is still far away from enlightenment and then he waits his whole life for enlightenment sitting in that posture it is 
the way of rituals. But it does not happen that way. When you look into the experience of enlightened ones, who, when you look into the experience of the enlightened ones, you will find uniqueness with each master. Existence never repeats itself. Rumi danced for 35 hours continuously. In that whirling he became aware of the unmoving within. Enlightenment means you are becoming aware of that which is unmoving in you. All the changes takes place on that axle. You are trying to become aware of that axle within you, that I within you. Instead of phone, phone is an outer mechanism. I is the inner mechanism. And the two, the modern technologies develop iPhone, a prestigious phone for everyone. In that whirling room, we became aware of that which was not moving. But all the change was happening on that. The axle in the wheel does not move, but it is the axle on which all the changes takes place. So the inner mechanism, the inner engineering, the eye is the consciousness, the awareness, the being is the axle. All inner search is for that excellent the awareness of that excellent ruby became enlightened the moment he became aware of the unmoving within this was the unique way and unique only because enlightenment happened to ruby that way sitting under the bodhi tree enlightenment happened to buddha but the buddhist monks the Sufis, they go on whirling, they have their own groups of the Sufi whirlers and whirling has become a ritual. They go and do the stage performances. Rumi did not do whirling for any stage performance. He did it for his own. It happened to him spontaneously. This is another unique way, only because of Buddha. And now look at the Buddhist monks following this ritual. Look at the followers of Rumi. They go on whirling throughout the life like a ritual. In that, certainly they became great performers but not enlightened. The world has produced only countable enlightened ones because of the human mind that always shelters and rituals and thus the superficial. Remember your rituals have the authentication of the religions. Now, the religion that evolved out of Rumi, that is Mevalana order, that has given the authentication to the whirling as the way to attain to enlightenment. So it is not a certain sequence of causes that bring enlightenment. Your search, your intense longing and your readiness to do anything all together. Perhaps they create a certain aroma around you in which that great accident becomes possible and enlightenment happens accident. But you cannot manage it. Every seeker has to begin from the very beginning in his own unique way. You cannot learn by watching somebody. That is what all the religions have been doing, like following like a copycat. There is a certain prayer, a certain posture, a certain ritual and a certain way of breathing. Nothing helps. I have always loved a small story of Liu Tolstoy from Russia. The Archbishop of Russia became very much annoyed because a small island, because on a small island, three men had come to be known to the population as saints. Now this is against Christianity. 
In Christianity, a saint has to be certified by the church and if it has to be a saint, it is a degree or a title not inner happy. This church has to ordain the sainthood on the appropriate person that church thinks right. The English word saint means sanction. That person has now gotten the sanction from the church and he is ordained as a saint. When the church gives a sanction, one becomes a saint. The archbishop was very angry that without his sanction, these three people have become known as saints. And thousands of people were going to touch their feet and see their blessings. Naturally, this was making him angry. One day he finally decided to go to see what kind of saints these were. He went in a motorboat, reached the island. It was very small island. Only three people lived there. It was early morning and those three were sitting under a tree. They looked simple, uneducated and illiterate people. Archbishop on the way was very nervous about facing these three saints who have influenced thousands of people. But now he saw there was no problem as these looked idiots. He went there and they had touched the feet of the Archbishop. He was very well satisfied. He said, do you think you are saints? They said, we are uneducated, illiterate, poor people. How can we think of such things? They are not for us. But what can we do? People go on coming. We try to prevent them. We tell them that they should go to you instead. But they do not listen. The Archbishop inquired authoritatively. What is your prayer? The three looked at each other and nodded. One said to the other, you say it. The other said, you say it. The Archbishop said, anybody can say it, there is no harm, but to start your prayer. They said, we feel very embarrassed because it is not really a prayer, but we have made it up ourselves. The Archbishop was really angry. You have invented the prayer? You have invented the prayer, the Archbishop murmured. What is the prayer? One of them said, if you really insist, we have to say it. We are feeling very embarrassed because the prayer is not a very great prayer. Instead, it is very simple. Our prayer is, you are three, we are three, have mercy on us. You are three, we are three, have mercy on us. What kind of prayer is this, Archbishop thought. Even the Archbishop in his anger had to laugh. He said, great, so this is your prayer. Those three people said, we are ready to learn from you. If you could teach us the right prayer, we will try it. But it should not be long because we may forget or we may make mistakes or get confused. Our prayer is so simple, we cannot forget it. We cannot make any mistake. The Archbishop read the whole prayer of the Orthodox Church of Russia. It was too long. Those three people said, it is too long. Please read it again. The third time they said, just one more time so we can remember. Archbishop was so happy that these idiots are no threats. Now there is no problem. I can convince people that they know nothing, not even the prayer of the church. They touched the Archbishop's feet, thanked him and told him that there was no need for him to come. He should have sent a message and they would come 
to see him. Why should he take such trouble? Any time he wanted, he should just send a message and they would come to the church itself. Very happy and contented, the Archbishop left in his motorboat. When he was just in the middle of the lake, he saw those three running on the water, coming towards him saying, Stop, we have forgotten the prayer, just one more to repeat. The Archbishop looked at them, they were standing on the water, running on the water. He must have been a man of some intelligence. Archbishop must have been the man of intelligence. He said, forgive me. Your prayer is right. You continue your prayer. Your prayer has reached. My prayer has not reached. You are really saints. It does not matter whether the church has sanctioned you or not. Sanctions are needed for those who are not really saints. The very existence of proofs of your prayer. Just forgive me that I have inter interfered in, my, in your life. Just forgive me that I interfered in your life. This is the story by Leo Tolstoy. It is possible with the purity of heart, with serenity of mind, and with calmness of the being, any word uttered becomes a prayer. Even this becomes a prayer. You are trees, we are, you are three, we are three, have mercy on us. And the great accident happens. But you cannot copy it. Just indeed, it is the problem. You can go to an island and sit under a tree and say you are three, we are three and have mercy on us, nothing will happen. Within an hour or two you will get bored and you will say this does not work. This is what it is happening. People go to one way, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Jewism, Hebrew, any way and a little while after they get fed up, no, this is not working. So they go to some other way. Existence has allowed enlightenment in so many different ways to people. All that we can say is that certain qualities are not very particular methods of detail. All that we can say is that certain qualities, not very particular methods are needed, but certain qualities when they come to meet within you, function not as a cause, but something happens because of their presence. This is what is this in science is called catalytic agent. They function as catalyst or catalytic agent. For example, you know that water is made with hydrogen and oxygen, but you can go on mixing hydrogen and oxygen in a certain proportion and water will not be obtained. If you divide water, you will not, you will find only hydrogen and oxygen. Then what is missing? Why even when mixing them in proper proportions, water will not happen? For that, the presence of electricity is needed. It does not cause it. It is a totally different phenomenon that cash, than casualty. However, its presence is a catalytic agent. Without its presence, without the presence of magnesium dioxide, Oxygen and hydrogen can remain all together for the eternity, but water will not happen. So when you see silver lines in black clouds, it is just, it is not just for painters and people who understand beauty and are sensitive to aesthetic values. That silver line is nothing but the presence of electricity that transforms hydrogen and oxygen into water. But scientists were 
surprised in the beginning because it does not take any part just its presence is needed but without its presence nothing happens so i can say to you that enlightenment is always an accident not an effort produced by a certain cause it is not a not a cause and effect relationship everybody could have produced the cause all the necessary ingredients and would have become enlightened if the lotus posture is needed he will do it if it's standing on the head is needed he will do it if sitting under a bodhi tree is needed he will do it if other men have been able to do it you can but the problem is that it is not a cause and effect phenomenon so i can describe only a certain presence which functions as a catalytic agent meditation creates the catalytic agent create a totally silent mind with no thoughts a totally relaxed body with no tensions a totally empty heart with no moods or feelings or sentiments or emotions and then simply wait in this silence serenity just wait and then out of nowhere something explodes in you yes it is an explosion indeed enlightenment is an explosion indeed explosion of light love and tremendous bliss which remains with you forever once it has blossomed it's this flower never withers you cannot lose it even if you want to nobody can become unenlightened again that is not possible so this is about enlightenment which is the ultimate flower enlightenment to the ultimate flower whether embodied or unembodied the enlightened one merges like a drop has merged into the ocean and then the ocean lends its magnanimity its splendor and cosmic oneness to the enlightened one the indomitable energy that enlightenment brings act as catalyst in the process of enlightenment of all those who are around the mere presence clears the path of inward journey buddha represents the highest peak of consciousness a master represents the buddha who the highest peak of consciousness buddha is the experiment in totality of consciousness but that represents the fruition of one's being or the blossoming as the enlightenment but that represents a totally different kind of spirituality pure and sublime never before this happened that someone spoke of human transformation in such profound yet uncontaminated way over the years each time the message of buddha overflowed the need was there to preserve the message in as many forms as may be possible but it never happened that time was not right subhati had asked will there be any being in the future period in the last time in the last epoch in the last 500 years at the time of the collapse of the good doctrine who when these words of the sutras are being taught will understand the embedded truth the lord replied do not speak the sutti yes even then there will be beings who when these words of the sutras are being taught will understand their truth for even at that time sutti there will be bodhi sattvas and these bodhi sattvas sugati will not be such as have honored only one single buddha 
nor such as have planted their roots of merits under one single Buddha only. On the contrary, Subhuti, those Bodhisattvas, who when these words of the Sutras are being taught, will find even one single thought of serene faith, be such as have honored many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, be such as have honored many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, such as have planted their roots of merits under many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, known they are Subhuti to Tathagata. Through his Bodhi cognition, seen they are Subhuti by the Tathagata within his Buddha eye, fully known they are Subhuti to Tathagata and they all, Subhuti, will be an acquire an impregnable and incalculable heap of merit. Therefore, Subhuti, listen well and attentively. The Buddha being, the energy field that, are, that the enlightened ones have created shall continue to act as catalyst in the process of transformation of human consciousness. Buddham Sharanam Gacchami, Dhamam Sharanam Gacchami, Sangham Sharanam Gacchami. Buddham Sharanam Gacchami, Dhamam Sharanam Gacchami, Sangham Sharanam Gacchami. Buddham Sharanam Gacchami Only this much for this morning.